good reason for this gun. I didn't have to stand to load it because I didn't have a ramrod. So I could load it from laying down. I could load it from laying behind the rock. I could load it and fire six to ten times a minute. Normal muzzle loader was maybe three times a minute. So all of a sudden you got a gun that's three times better than the muzzle loader. So the first question everybody asks is, how come they didn't all have this gun? Well, it was very simple. This was $43 to $48. And most muzzle loaders were $12 to $18. So they could arm three men with muzzle loaders versus the one for this. So that was the reason why. They actually, there was a statement on the con congressional floor where they actually stated, we can't afford to give them all breech loaders because if they did, they shoot up so much ammunition, we won't be able to afford to have them more. So the logic in Washington, as you can see, hasn't changed very much. I think the same people are thinking the same way or something. Um, anybody have any questions or anything? Wasn't the breech load more of a new, newer? Uh, it was very new. It was patented in 1853, yeah, and it improved and made better in 1859. This is the Sharps rifle. It was made uh, in Connecticut. Uh, there was actually offices before the war in Connecticut, Philadelphia, and Richmond. Okay? During the war, the Confederates made a copy of the Sharps. It was called the Richmond Sharps. It was identical to a certain degree, but it wasn't, didn't have the workmanship that the, the rifles from the North had. You've got to remember now, there was nothing fair about the Civil War at all. It started out, there were 22 million in the North. Most of them were affluent. They were a machine society. They were mechanically inclined, almost all of them. They had money. In the North, you had 12 million people, okay, versus 22. And then, oh, I forgot something. It was 3 million slaves. So now you got 9 million against 22 million. Oh, I forgot something else, too. The Southern agriculture was their major way of making money, and that was the way their, their society ran all around agriculture. So now you got 9 million against 22 million. The people in the North had all the money and all the manufacturing facilities. The people in the South had very little to go on. And during the war, they did mar miraculous things. They, they learned to do more on their own. Uh, the women saved uh, the urine for niter. They made gunpowder out of the urine. That was some of the things they did. The Confederacy actually had a balloon. I think some of you might have seen it. They used the balloons for observation. They made it out of women's petticoats, silk petticoats. It was a hot air balloon. Was, and they, they did, a, did a tremendous amount. Uh, one of the things that helped the South was that when the war started, the North had mostly political generals, and they were so incompetent that they couldn't find their way out of a paper bag. And that helped the North, or that helped the South a lot. Uh, gradually, they came around. When Grant got in power, he got rid of and cashiered most of the people that were political generals, and, or at least that put them someplace where they couldn't cause any trouble. And Southern had Southern had great leaders. They had Claiborne. Stonewall Jackson, Lee, Longstreet. You know, they, had, they had a tremendous amount of really unbelievably good generals. If you, if you notice, I'm talking for both sides. It's mainly because I also do the 4th Alabama. <laughs> so so I, I, I do what they call galvanize. I go on both sides of the, the field. I believe the war was important to us. It shows us where some of our heritage came from. And, uh, it's important to the little guys and little girls, and that's why I do a lot of school stuff. So it's a lot of, a lot of fun to see the kids get interested. I know I'm, my first interest in this, well, I finished it when I was 40 something. It's a good book. It got me stuck. They had the, a, lot of, a lot of soldiers from nine different states. Sharpshooters were kind of neat in a way because uh, they were the only unit in the whole war that had a uh, shooting requirement. They had to shoot 10 shots in a 10 inch bullseye from 200 yards away which is a pretty good long distance shot. Yes, in a 10 inch bullseye. 10 inch bullseye is about the size of a pie plate. Usually your pies are about 10 inches that you want. The women know that. Some, some lady told me that. I didn't know. <laughs> way we learned. You want to see what, basically when we fired, this gun was kind of neat to fire. You'd open breech, reach around, reach back here. It was one piece shell. Six grains black powder. I'm not allowed to carry it, so you can imagine. You shove it in the breech. Sticks out a little bit. I shut it off. I cut it off. The back is now open on the shell. It was like a cotton fiber material. I got 60 grains of black powder in it, but I have no way to set it off. I go to half cock, which, by the way, is where the saying came from. Don't go up half cock. That's half cock position. You go to half cock, reach in your cap box, take out a little thing that looks like Abe Lincoln's hat, 
It's brass. It's got one grain of fulminated mercury in it. Put that on the nipple. You're going to full cock and now basically you're ready to shoot. Now, you'll notice something immediately. I've got two triggers. Okay? Second trigger is a setting trigger. The setting trigger, if you pull, it makes a little tiny click. Now, if you touch the front trigger, it will go off immediately. It makes the front trigger a hair trigger. Now, why would I want that? Well, very simply, if I want to shoot a long shot, I don't want to take a chance on shaking. So if it's a hair trigger, I'm not going to shake the weapon, so I'm giving more accuracy in a long shot. In the field, we have found probably most of the Berdan rifles were single triggered. The double triggers had a tendency to, to be a problem in the field. They got full dirt and stuff. Uh, they had real small operating clearances. Uh, metallurgy in those days wasn't as good as it is nowadays. We couldn't case harden as well as we can nowadays. So basically, they, they probably had a problem. They could switch it right over to single trigger. Single triggers would be just like your common guns that you have today. You just pull cock, cock the hammer and, and shoot them. Single action, of course. Anybody have any questions? You go to uh, like target range? And 60 rounds. Uh, you carry maybe about 60 to 40 rounds in here, depending on how well you loaded it. If you had extra, if you know you're going into a big battle, you maybe have 100, so you put 40 rounds extra in your haversack. Caps you included. You need three items to uh, make that fire. Three things. To, uh, you got to have a piece of lead. Yeah. Your mercury uh, thing. Yeah, fulminated mercury. Right. Now, the, the piece of lead was actually the same piece as your, uh, as your gunpowder was. It was one piece. If you look over in that box over there, you see the white shells that are in the middle? That's basically what we fired. They were one piece. So the lead and the powder was actually one. The only thing you needed after that was the fulminated mercury in the cap. That was a little brass cap, and like I said, it looked like uh, basically like uh, Abe Lincoln's hat. It's like a little top hat. That's a little brim around it and everything else. So you could pull it off. What's the muzzle load where you need the three, right? The yeah, they had, a, they had a paper cartridge. They, uh, field infantry only required two things. You had to be able to walk without a limp, and you had two upper teeth and two lower teeth. Which, believe it or not, was a requirement up until what? About 42. Yeah, 42. They, the service still required that. Uh, basically, why did you need that? Because the cartridge of paper, you bit the end off of it, you poured the powder in, you pushed the ball down, you took your ramrod, rammed it down the rest of the way. Put your ramrod back, which is one of the things they had a lot of problem with them not doing, because if they left the ramrod in there, it would shoot once, and they'd have two level things going down range. But then all of a sudden, you had a 10 pound club with nothing to load it again. So that was why they taught the, the field infantry to load in the nine times. They had nine separate steps to load a muzzle loader, whereas this gun only had four. Hence, we could shoot six to ten times a minute, and they could shoot three times a minute. The uh, elite rifle companies. And uh, we, we found that it worked very well for us. We have all, you know, mostly earthen stuff. You don't see anything shiny on my uniform. Black rubber buttons made by Goodyear. Uh, we didn't polish our brass. Uh, a lot of the, the infantry looked upon us as very slovenly soldiers because we didn't polish anything. We had on the, the gaiters, which protected our legs when we were out in the field. Uh, they also protected our pants. The average length of a pair of pants in the field was like 16 weeks. So obviously, if you couldn't get green, you see a lot of our soldiers that be wearing blue pants also. Generally, the coat lasted a pretty good long time. Most of what we found, the clothes didn't wear out if it wasn't torn. It probably just rotted off their body. 